So, good morning, everyone. Happy to have you all on board again for this third Euro practice webinar on microfluidics. After the introduction session and a first in-depth presentation related to bioassay transfer and translation to devices, we are now moving into the production capabilities. The one of today focuses on glass manufacturing and will also touch upon measurement protocol standards. The presentation will be given by Dr. Alexios Zanes of INT AG in Switzerland. Dr. Zanes has been working for INT for 13 years and is responsible for developing the life science and diagnostics activities of the company. He studied at the Technical University of Denmark, DTU, and obtained the degree of Master of Science in Electrical Engineering in the field of technical holography. He received his PhD at the ETH Zurich for his work at Paul Scherrer Institute in the field of resonant holographic interferometry. Uh, Alexios also uh, holds lots of hands-on experience in micro and nanotechnology, MEMS, optics and optoelectronics, spectroscopy and microfluidics. If I may repeat shortly our house rules again before we start. Uh, you're all muted now and I would like to ask you to remain muted during the whole session. Uh, questions can be posed during the webinar through the chat channel and will be answered to at the end. If you come up with more questions afterwards, you're free to contact me. With this, we are ready to start for a new session. Please enjoy. So Alexios, the, floors, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Riet. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for participating at the third workshop. I'm going to uh, make a presentation on the glass fabrication of microfluidic flow cells and what endeavors are made in order to create protocol standards uh, in order to facilitate upscaling and high volume manufacturing. So that is fundamentally my title. Going to the overview of the presentation, I would like to uh, talk something about the fundamental building blocks of a microfluidic component. What is it, what it consists of? How can we translate that into a mask design? Fundamentally, when we are talking about glass fabrication, we are going to be talking about lithographic processes and how can they be applied in the production of microfluidic flow cells. Uh, I will take you through the fundamental glass lithography processes naturally, which is wet etching, lift off and etching of glass in order to generate the microfluidic channel network. Uh, naturally, when we have microfluidic components, we will have to drill some holes on the glass in order to get access to the channel network. And of course, since we are doing uh, wafer level processing, we have to bond the wafers together. So we are going to go through the different bonding techniques. And of course, what kind of singulation methodologies are available and what are best applicable. And finally, uh, I'm going to take you through the standards of the Microfluidic and Association that has been founded towards standard in production of microfluidic components. And I'll try to draw some conclusions out of that. So when we're talking about the fundamental of microfluidic flow cells, then there are three fundamental things. Creating a channel network where your fluids are going to work through. You need a transduction element, meaning what is it doing the measurement? That could be, for example, integrating electrodes within the microfluidic network, putting waveguides, actuative membranes, or even functionalization in terms of immobilization chemistry to capture your analyte. And finally, of course, you need the interfacing to the outside world, providing optical access, holes for fluidic interfacing, or side access for the fluidic channel networks, or holes uh, in order to do the electrical interface with integrated electrodes. Fundamentally, when we are Talking about a microfluidic component, generally you have a 
biochemical assay that you would like to translate into microfluidic component, meaning doing processing of purifying your analyte from a sample, doing some intermediate re-steps in order to facilitate its measurement. So what you're trying to do then is to describe the bioassay, defining the into individual blocks, try to design a microfluidic component that we that will reflect these individual blocks and then of course do some prototyping and pre-production samples in order to demonstrate the functionality of that component that basically facilitates the biochemical assay now if we look about glass i have put here some of our uh, products that we are producing talking going from impedance flow cells to ngs flow cells to simple microfluidic straight flow cells small flow cells with integrated waveguides or with electrical impedance flow cells or even multiple level uh, glass components to create double emulsion droplets and all of those requires a channel network that needs to be described and there starts the difficulties because there is no standard if we can call it software that can do the job so i have uh, I took the liberty to show you here some of the work that has been done at uh, the Boston University where people are describing microfluidic components in terms of micrometer components like here on the left, a straight channel, a wide junction, mixer, you, uh, rectangular mixer or a multiplexer you can combine those in order to create uh, microfluidic channels nonetheless this is the one part of the job is describing by building blocks a microfluidic channel at the same time you would like to make sure that this thing functioning correctly we are going to look to, into that a little bit later so ideally you can say that uh, another step that you could do would be perhaps to take uh, already uh, microfluidic solutions that have been working line them up and create a completely new assay uh, here you see one example that comes from uh, the cider once again for bu where they have the 3D microfluidic uh, platform to design microfluidic components. And basically what they're demonstrating here is they have four different uh, uh, microfluid components, one for doing lysis, one for doing DNA di digestion, plasmid ligation and transformation, and fundamentally placing those in the row you could perform cloning. But you can do that on individual components, then you can go ahead and do a, uh, if you would call it a, uh, a new de redesign where you form those into a new, uh, new uh, component. My apologies, I have to log into my security software, otherwise I'm going to be locked out. Just a second, please. I mean again um, so when we are talking about lithography and lithography masks when we are designing masks to uh, to uh, create the channel network then you need to uh, use the same rules creating straight lines closed polygons and so on on classical CAD designs Nonetheless, you have to consider the isotropicity of etching in glass. So fundamentally, a straight line like that will create isotropically etched channels. And by intelligent design, you can fundamentally create quite interesting solutions. Like here, when we are having basically physical constraints of the channel network. 
So I'll try to take you through one very simple microfluidic component in order to understand what processes are involved and what kind of metrology is also involved on those. So when we're looking about classical uh, lithographical processes, I think people coming from uh, MEMS and IC industry, they know them all more than less, more than good. Uh, classical lift off of metals and dielectric coatings, etching of metals and dielectric coatings, and what we have maybe a little bit new, it's etching in glass and the particularities that these have that I'll try to explain to you in more detail further on down the line. Uh, I have here a very simple one level glass flow cell that basically consists you can see it here illustrated as a photograph on the side as cross cut where you basically have one glass wafer with edge channels a second glass wafer with drilled holes and you put them together in order to create a microfluidic component here we have basically a blow up of these uh, with the individual uh, steps basically the glass has been etched. This is the channel network you're to, trying to generate the top wafer with the axis holes, perhaps some kind of a Vishnu. Can you please turn off your microphone? And the complete flow cell at the end of the day. So if we look at the, uh, the flow through the different production steps that are indicated in gray, the necessary metrology steps that is indicated in gray, and then what kind of control do we do? Are we doing a merely process control or are we doing a 100% inspection of the components? So we said again, we have a top wafer to generate fluidic holes. That's kind of a simple thing. We just do a whatever process we choose and do an automatic optical inspections for the dimensions and the alignment by a means of a CMS tool that is basically just a tool doing uh, uh, geometrical uh, optical measurements. For the bottom wafer, we have several lithographical processes. First, we are defining the mask layer. So we are do creating openings in the mask in order to get access to the glass. Here we will measure the critical dimensions by uh, means of a classical optical microscope. We will perform the etching and measure the depth by means of laser confocal. Then we are going to marry the two wafers. And of course, we would like to marry them in a way that we have well-defined and confined channels. So the bonding, we want to measure if there are any defects, classical visual inspection, and of course, using automation when we are talking about high volume manufacturing in order to identify defects uh, in terms of etching or bonding. Uh, here, there are automatic optical inspection tools that comes from the semi industry that do an excellent work on that. Then, after we have been doing some kind of a singulation of the component, we would like to uh, measure its dimensions. Did we cut it right? So dimensions, alignment, chipping, and other uh, specifications that are necessary. And then finally, inspection and packaging, and hoping that the component is clean uh, according to the customer needs. Classical visual inspection. If you're looking in the industry, there is an abundance of uh, metrology equipment that serve specific height and lateral, lateral ranges. Uh, usually in a classical lithography uh, fab, you're going to have all of those like optical profilers, scanning electron microscopes, AFMs, tactile measurement equipment, and of course, an abundance of microscope, optical microscopes. And of course, when we're talking about optical properties, transmission reflect of the material, for example, glass is often used when you're doing low fluorescence detection. So you would like to know how is the transmission uh, in the specific wavelength area. 
And if you're trying to look through, for example, to do a cell identification or another analyte, you would like to have a minimized scratch and dig on the surface where you are looking through. So in order to do that, you have manual inspection and or automatic optical equipment to perform that. Then you would like to measure the, uh, the coupling efficiency of waveguides. This is basically done with the visual inspections and simulations. I'm not going to dwell into that because this is a very particular thing. And when we're talking about ge geometry, there are 2D and 3D measurements by terms of uh, SEMS, UV confocal microscope, stylocrophilometers. Uh, surface properties like roughness that is uh, imperative for microfluid components because this uh, you would like to have more the surface energy to add uh, to to dominate the, the the process rather than a rough surface so you need to specify that and surface energy by classical contact angle measurements that are uh, quite standardized electrical properties by classical four-point measurements. These are all processes that you will find in a classical glass mesh foundry. And let's take one example here, just to make the case of an argument using liftoff uh, methodologies. Well, you're creating basically a photoresist pattern. You are sputtering or evaporating a metallic layer. In this case here, you see we have golden electrodes on a wafer naturally you can do platinum or other metals uh, that suits uh, this specific application uh, but usually gold is a well accepted though expensive material platinum is also well accepted though expensive material titanium is also a beautiful material to create electrodes and do uh, that are also biocompatible we can always talk about that a little bit later. So a uh, very standard process. Fundamentally, what you would like uh, uh, to measure on that would be the critical dimension of the generated electrodes. We are going to come to that afterwards. Now we come to the fundamental process of creating channel networks. Once again, we make a metal layer, we create a photoresist on top of it, open the metal layer and etch the glass. And hopefully my oh, uh, presentation is gonna work. No, it will not work today. So my apologies, no little video running. But nonetheless, what is important to understand in etching glass are many parameters that have to be considered, but what you have to understand in terms of the channel morphology is that due to the isotropic etching of glass, you have a specific depth. The width will be the opening of your mask plus twice the depth. So you have always an aspect ratio of at least one to two. Naturally, wet chemical etching requires a very good understanding of the processes. There are two classical ways of doing it using a bath. So you're doing isotropic etching in classical bath formats, as you can see here. Here you see the uh, classical bathtub-like uh, profile of such channels. Alternatively, you can use spray etching chambers where you can utilize also uh, a, a higher level of automation. In this case, this machine does a complete dry in, dry out process. What you would do the whole cycle of, uh, of uh, the processing of etching in glass uh, in this machine. So you'll do, do the resist development, etch the chrome, create access to the glass, etch the glass and then strip the resist, strip the chrome and get the pure glass out of it with an excellent homogeneity over 16 wafers. And that is requires, of course, a good understanding of the masking that you're going to use because fundamentally uh, you don't want to have pinholes, you don't want to have all kind of disturbing effects like these ones, for example, here that you see a classical error of the glass that has been transferred into 
the microfluidic channel. You would like to make sure that no adducts are being redeposited on the glass and create a rough surface. And you would like to fundamentally transfer the excellent surface roughness of high quality glasses like Eagle, D2623, Mempax, and so on directly into the channel, maintaining a surface roughness of few nanometers. Fundamentally, in both of these uh, methodologies, you would like to measure the critical dimension of, uh, of the uh, structures, being those the gold electrodes or the channel width. And once again, uh, you have the possibility of using SEM, scanning probe microscope, automatical optical inspection, or classical optical microscope. They all have an imaging artifact that needs calibration. So there is a quite a well understood, uh, or it's a quite a well understood measurable. Everybody uses it every day in the lab. There's a rather complex ISO landscape. I have left some information here. I'm not going to dwell into the ISO. I'm just going more to show how we classically do it in our fab. Uh, so when we are talking about doing a measurement of the critical dimension by, say, a classical microscope at IMT. We do the following procedure. We have a calibration tool. We calibrate the microscope with the periodicity that we have internally uh, decided upon utilizing the ISO 9000. And then we use the measurement uh, the, micro, the calibrating microscope to measure the generating patterns. Of course, what the customer would like to see is that when we are measuring, we're measuring the correct thing. So apart the calibration, we use a gauge RNR to verify repeatability and reproducibility of the measuring process. This is usually a part of the documentation for the specific uh, product we deliver to our the same thing here for the surface roughness or the surface depth of the channels. Uh, we are using uh, a confocal uh, microscope, a uh, laser confocal microscope. There are uh, definitions about how you can use that to measure surface texture or other parameters. You are more free than free to go and look at those. Fundamentally, what you get, you get a roughness profile as I indicated here. And once again, uh, your laser confocal microscope needs a gauge to calibrate it uh, with a periodicity that you have to uh, decide upon. You need uh, education of your uh, people doing the measurements and documentation by gauge R and R. So we have demonstrated now that we can etch channels in the bottom wafer and we can measure that we have got the right profile of these channels. So now we're going to address the generation of the top wafer that I have uh, started with and try to show how we can make fluidic access holes in glass wafers. So there is an abundance of material of processes to do that. Uh, here you can see uh, three classical ones. That is powder blasting, ultrasonic drilling, or laser ablation. They have all their pros and cons. The big advantage of uh, powder blasting is that you do that on more or less a wafer level. Ultrasonic drilling and laser ablation is hole by hole. And then you have to get the pros and cons because you would like to have a cheap and affordable process of doing holes on the wafer. There are also other cons constraints that have to be considered. For example, chipping, that is the little roughness around the hole in the entrance or the exit that can create bubbles or dead volumes that you would like to avoid. Uh, if we look some more detail here, what, how does the, pla the, the, the powder blasting, blasting process works? Fundamentally, you have a, a substrate. You create 
classical lithography means a mask material that is a soft material and have particles injected with high volume by high velocity on the wafer when they find the mask material they're going to bounce back in a way an elastical scattering if you would like hits the glass it starts etching it away into that's why you have also this v form into it uh, it's a very good scalable process and of course due to lithography you have a good alignment with say the structures uh, channel, channel network on a wafer level you can of course do laser blasting uh, lasers have won a lot uh, uh, a lot of uh, of market in 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 this area why because you have different laser uh, machinery you can go from nanosecond picosecond femtosecond uh, lasers the faster the pulses the more accurate the uh, the hole that you drill the more expensive your wafer becomes so there is always a balance to be taken here you can clearly see here the uh, nanosecond holes versus the picosecond holes that you have much less chipping this is due to the generation of make micro cracks when uh, you're creating ablation uh, processes at the same time though this is usually pico and femtosecond lasers have much longer processing times and therefore consequently also more expensive don't forget it is hole by hole so if you're having 200 holes that's going to take a long time uh, another alternative is doing a combination of laser filamentation and etching so uh, it's a process that we utilize here at imt uh, basically you're creating micro -dam damages where the etchant is uh, preferentially etching through and then you create kind of a pill that is going to drop off the hole if you would like uh, creates very nice vertical walls with an acceptable surface roughness of two micrometers you can uh, perform an excellent alignment to your edge channels minimizing dead volumes and uh, 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 there are some restrictions because of course you cannot use this process for all materials or all glass wafers available Nonetheless, you can do also exotic uh, structures like uh, these here, uh, glass springs that looks very nice, cannot be used. But uh, more seriously, you can create interposer glass wafers with a minimum uh, thickness of, let's say, down to 200 micrometers or other. So you can create interposers for com complex microfluidic uh, structures fundamentally after we have ha uh, made the holes here you can see on the right side a wafer with many 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 holes uh, you use a coordinate measuring system like this one uh, from OGP utilizing a standardized uh, ISO process for geometrical product specifications having a gauge to uh, calibrate it and a gauge R&R to verify once again repeatability and reproducibility you can generate automatic data that can be delivered together with uh, the, the, the product to the customer so now we have documented that we can generate the bottom wafer with the channels and we have measured them we have generated the top wafer and we have measured them now we are going to bond the two wafers together and we'll go through the bonding techniques that are available i'm going to focus on three fusion uv adhesive and laser assisted room temperature bonding anodic and autotic are, are available not very often utilized so currently fusion or direct bonding as it's called you fundamentally bring two glass surfaces in a very very tight proximity in order to get the van der Waals forces of the co2 
uh, uh, of the of, excuse me of the silicon oxide molecules to start working together. In order to do that, of course, you have to remove everything in order to bring the silicon oxide molecules close together. That means you remove all kind of residues, dirt, particles, organics, and everything. And what you're doing is you create this pre-bond that you basically bring them in the optical contact and then anneal them by high temperatures, creating a, uh, a chemical reaction on the surface. So you need surface roughnesses below half a nanometer in order to get the molecules into contact. You need to be able to control the wafer bow, the TTV of the wafers, and of course the contaminate. Imagine that if you see this hole here is generating that has a, let's call it diameter of several millimeters, it's probably generated by a small dust particle of a couple of micrometers. And of course, if you try to squeeze too hard surfaces around a micrometer uh, dust or glass or whatever particle, you're going to get this kind of confinement. You would like to avoid those, of course. So when we are looking basically more in the chemistry, what you're doing, you're creating a hydrophilic bonding at room temperature, where you have stable hydrogen bonds between the water molecules along the bonded surface that would be somewhere there. Then by increasing temperature, you create stable silocene bonds and you have your physical strong bonding that you can really not break. Mind you though, it requires elevated temperatures in order to break up the silicon dioxide molecule. There's another alternative that is a room temperature. So basically, once again, consider you have the one wafer with your edge channels, you have your top wafer where it has some holes and you would like to bring them into contact. If you put an adhesive in the proximity there where they should go into contact together, you can get basically the, the same effect. For that, you need specialized equipment uh, in order to bring the adhesive just on the area of where the two wave gets into contact and naturally avoid filling your channel network with, uh, with the adhesive. Uh, for that, there are specialized equipment from the semicon industry where basically what you're doing, you spin coat the adhesive on a sacrificial wafer, you roll it back and forth over the wafer and basically kind of an old potato stamping methodology, if you would like to call it, you bring a small layer of an adhesive just on the area, take your second wafer, align it, press it on top of it, utilize UVA light, uh, to uh, harden the adhesive and you have an excellent bonding with very high, uh, how we call it, uh, pressure, uh, pressure, uh, burst pressure. Uh, it has the advantages that it's compatible to a wide range of pressure, temperature and pHs. It's a biocompatible material provided that you choose the right one. And the most important, it is a room temperature. An alternative to that is laser assisted bonding process. Uh, this is work it functions by a similar way as the fusion bonding. You bring the two wafers into optical contacts and then you usually, and then you utilize a laser to create a small plasma uh, in the interface of the two wafers and that is going to create the bond and these are more small lines along the channel wall network that you can see them here as white lines and uh, that guarantees also a encapsulation of biomaterials, liquids and other sensitive components uh, excellent hermeticity and naturally also a room temperature bond. So mind you that these, the room temperature bond key components to enable microfluidic uh, solutions. Why? Because usually you would like to incorporate in your microfluidic solution some kind of a chemistry to immobilize your analyte. That means 
a chemistry that won't, that will capture your protein or your DNA sample or whatever. So we have two techniques here, UV adhesive process, uh, transfer bonding process or laser assisting, assisted bonding process that facilitates that. Okay, now once we have uh, bonded that, uh, this uh, wafer together by means of, uh, of uh, fusion bonding, adhesive bonding or laser bonding, you can basically chop up a little part, glue it between two of those uh, metallic constrictions and try to pull it at each other to see if the bond strength is there. So here we utilize a uh, variation of the semi-MS5 test method of wafer bond strength without the severance test structures. And you can get basically a ramp and sometimes it's gonna break. That indicates what is the both bond strength usually measured in megapascal. Uh, in terms of visual inspection, you remember I showed you an image of an enclosure between the two glass surfaces. Here it is again, classical optical microscope or with white light interferometer. You would like to quantify those and definitely avoid them, in particularly in the proximity of your channel because there is where your analyte might get lost. Um, but once again, this is an optical inspection. There is no documentation. It's very difficult to do that on a wafer level. Uh, you can utilize automatic optical inspection as this tool from, from screen to do that in a classical cassette and cassette configuration. We have taken this tool and modified it uh, with customized software in order to facilitate exactly identified in the enclosures, measuring pinholes, scratches, and stuff like that on the surface. Do a defect display. So you have here, for example, a wafer map with the bad microfluidic components. You get in some statistics and you get in also a defect size distribution. Naturally, you can take that, you can synchronize it with a laser marking tool to kill off the bad components or add a serial numbering and get really qualified data that you can provide to the customer together with your components. So what we have done now, we have created the two wafers, we have bonded them together and we have measured the interface. We know we have created good flow cells and now we would like to take the flow cells out of the wafer pair that we have bonded together. There are many industrial solutions. Uh, one of them is dicing. It's in using classical dye source, scribing. It's basically using a needle, running over the wafer, and you applying physical pressure to, uh, to cut them apart. Or laser cutting that is a more industrialized and getting more and more popular methodology. And let's go and look two of those techniques. Uh, singulation by saw dicing, very well established technique. You can use it for basically all materials, glass or silicon, or even hydrobridge of glass and silicon wafers together. It is, has a very high dicing accuracy, minimal chipping, has one disadvantage, of course, fundamentally, you are losing real estate due to the physical dimensions, and you can only get rectangular forms out of this. And note also, if you would like to have side exits of your fluidic network, this is not going to work because all this water and slurry is going to dig itself into the channel network, and it's very difficult to clean it. An alternative to that is Laser assisted dye where you're using perforation, uh, works excellent in transparent materials, provided that uh, the reflectivity is not more than 30%. You're going to get this chain of, uh, of uh, ultra fast uh, small holes generated into the glass by the self focusing of the picosecond laser. I'm creating a Part motion, you're going to make kind of a curtain 
if you applied some small physical or thermal force, you're going to cut the components apart. The big advantage of that is you have really minimal chipping out of it. You have zero curve. Uh, you can cut through dielectric coatings, though not metallic coatings, and you can basically make free forms like you can see here with several side exits that are here, one, two, three, four, five channels going in, three going out. You can actually create like this one here, the way you see in the channel going out from a uh, corner of a microfluidic component. And actually you can make the nice good old poker yoga safe fifth corner just for free without any sacrificial space. Very good technique, works excellently. Now we have cut it to cut the wafer with the laser or with the dyson tool and we can use once again a coordinate measuring system to measure chipping, to measure dimensions, to measure hole to a channel a network a, a positioning and so on and so on. Once again by calibration and gauge R and R. As you can see now, we have demonstrated that we can fundamentally do all the physical dimensions. We can refer them to an ISO norm or utilize industrial equipment, utilizing internal processes and calibrated norm gauges uh, to do these measurements. We have demonstrated that we have built it according to our wishes. We still do not know if this microfluidic component is going to work. So we need to do reliability and validation of the components, like for example, the flow distributors, the chip holders, the pumps and valves. We need to do a demonstration of the coatings or the physiochemical properties that we have not looked into in currently. Uh, accelerated aging and shelf life, storage and operation, sterilization, is it necessary? And what are the environmental influences on the operation of the flow cell? A lot of those are not really uh, documented and really do not exist in any means. Additionally to that, we have realized in the industry that there is a common language missing and this is something that we are working to generate. Additionally to that, we need standards and guidelines for measuring protocols because as I demonstrated, some of the protocols are generically generated from IMT does not mean that a second foundry you're going to talk to utilize the same uh, methodologies, the same metrology. Consequently, possibly the results are different. Also, a customized protocol that has been developed for one specific assay won't necessarily work for the next assay. And uh, the advantages uh, of generating a standard and, and guidelines uh, 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 platform would be to enable a faster research and faster industry development and of course utilizing latest technologies and latest measurement technologies that can be documented we can create a flexible and user-friendly environment for people to generate new solutions fundamentally though the biggest requirement and constraint is to meet license regulatory framework requirements. Here, uh, uh, NIST and FDA starts putting more and more pressure to create this kind of legalistic, if you would like, framework that is going, that needs to be fulfilled and needs to be documented. In order to facilitate that, a, the Microfluidic Association has been developed with they mean to facilitate uh, the generation of guidelines and standards. Uh, we have defined four groups, the modularity, flow control, interfacing and testing methods. Uh, and the pathway to today has started already in 2010, where within the microfluidic consortium, 
we were discussing about the lack of standards. We have been working for some time in that area, and we finally had our official launch of the Microfluidic Association on February 2nd, 2020. A uh, very nice uh, day, 0202 2020. And then came the COVID, and we are still working on the next steps, probably on a virtual arena as we are doing today. What are we trying to do, and what is the way ahead that we are trying to, uh, to, to establish? Is create a vocabulary, meaning create definitions of properties, components, and functions. Define this so that everybody understands what we mean with that. Trying to find out means of device failure. Create a list uh, of parameters that needs to be tested. Cross-reference with existing norms and see, well, can we do it? Can we lend a norm that's already existing out there? If not, then we should generate a protocol for not specified parameter and preferentially then create a measuring protocol uh, that uh, can be described and the test benches in instruments that are required to do the job. And of course, talk with different external standard institutes to find the best way of doing that. So generating that we believe that there is in, uh, in, in the industry, in the generic industry, standard methods and reference documents where we can uh, utilize in order to create this methodology, doing the wording list, which tests needs to be performed to cross-reference and or generate a new testing protocol for all these four different, let's call it, blocks of open uh, to be defined parameters. Okay. So when we're talking about vocabulary, every norm starts with a vocabulary describing what in God's name they're going to talk about. The same thing we have been preparing here you can find a, an uploadable version of our microfluidics vocabulary under this URL. Uh, and the next question that comes is, are there norms that we can refer to for questions, for parameters that we would like to specify? It? Luckily, they are. I'll bring you a couple of examples here. One of them is cytotoxicity. I have a lot of materials. I want to demonstrate that they, uh, that they are biocompatible, cytotoxic safe. There is a very nice established protocol that you can use. And you can do that. For example, here is a demonstrator for our UV adhesive that we utilize in our solutions, where you basically demonstrate that it is cytotoxic safe. We have performed that with all the involved materials of, uh, of, the, tech, of the applied flow cells that we are doing, from bulk materials like the glass, the inorganic materials like gold, chrome, titanium, dielectric coatings, surface uh, coatings, and for example, the epoxy or SU8 photoresist. Uh, demonstrating that then you don't have to go and say, okay, will this work for my analyte? Because all the involved components have been documented, so that speeds up development time. Let's take one example here for the maximal operational uh, uh, pressure that we I extracted it from the fifth MFA workshop uh, in July two years ago, nearly where we kind of said, okay, we need to define the maximum operational pressure, what is the measurement, what is the definition, and try to find out what is the right way to describe it. Luckily, there are initial possibilities of doing that. There is the Dean for sealing tests in different uh, methodologies, for example, by using a test gas like helium and see if you leak, or 
pressurize your microfluidic component, wait for equilibrium. If the pressure drops falls, so then you have a leakage. Doesn't necessarily give you the maximum operational uh, pressure because this is something that has to be agreed, agreed upon on the specific uh, the specific microfluidic component. But here we can see one other example. You can see the bone strength or the burst pressure test, if you would like it. You basically increase pressure until it breaks. And here is the whole setup. Here is, you see, one component where the fusion bond in between two wafers was bad. And you can see that the material leaked from it. Is this the right way to create a documentation about the maximum operational pressure? This is not yet defined to date. So, going to conclusions, glass microfluidics uh, is a well-established technology. It facilitates very accurate microfluidic channel work networks. Some of the best running solution, microfluidic solutions in the market are based on lithographical processes on glass wafers. For example, NGS today without lithography on glass would not exist fundamentally. You can integrate different transduction mechanisms in order to facilitate small and accurate sensing elements, if you would like to call it like that. You can create solutions that are very robust for harsh, harsh environments, like, for example, high pHs, pressures, and temperatures. And for people that come in from the silicon industry, I believe that I demonstrated that glass and silicon have production schemes that are complementary. And we, uh, from the glass microfluidic industry, can uh, profit from the upscaling capabilities uh, from the CMI industry. At the other side, we have some uh, flexibility because we can utilize non-semi-compatible materials like, for example, gold or functionalization in terms of different uh, binding chemistry like amine or azide chemistry. Uh, it is possible to hybridize use silicon glass solutions by taking the best of both worlds. And of course, we can profit from the methodologies, metrologies, and best practices from the CMI world. And naturally also from the back end and in particularly the front end solutions that are already established in the industry. Uh, on terms of uh, standards and guidelines, there are a lot of unknowns about reliability of microfluidic uh, solutions and their operation modes. And this tends to be a hurdle for the field of microfluidics and needs a lot of work in order to create these standards and guidelines. Uh, we know that there is a big pressure from the regulatory agencies that would like to have more standards in order to facilitate their decision-making processes. And they would like to uh, engage device developer earlier in the pro product life cycle in order to eliminate all these uh, uh, dead end uh, tests. And uh, for the industry, it's very important to have uh, measuring protocols because we, it makes ourselves comparable for the customer and it makes it also transparent how we produce things, how we measure things, and that makes development of the individual product faster. And of course, that faster creates supply chains with a good economy of scale. And naturally, we need a collaboration between academia, industry, and metrology, and people that are willing to share the know-how in order to create these meaningful standards and guidelines with a maximum profit for us all. With that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, Alexios, for your instructive presentations. We are indeed now ready for um, questions. Uh, but I will start with one which I also asked to uh, the previous uh, presenters. 
and that is uh, what do you see as the main bottleneck for further development of microfluidic devices in the future? In in the future, yes. I think one of of the big hurdles for me is for me or for the industry is indeed one the standardization. We lose a lot of time of I would not call it reinventing the wheel, but it is of taking a component every time from scratch to document that the the components that are involved, the materials that are involved are uh, according to the needs of the regulatory agencies. This is one of the big hurdles. Second, of course, is the integration of the assay. And this is one of, of a big hurdle. I would say, how how do you make sure that your analyte is going to stick on the particular area where you would like to measure it? That means creating the environment to measure your analyte with a high reproducibility. Thank you. And you already gave a warm invitation to everyone to uh, pay more attention to uh, standardization. So hopefully we get uh, more responses they are more than welcome for to... uh, volunteers to participate. Yes, yes that. please. Yes. Um, there is another question uh, which probably will come back in the coming sessions as well, uh, since it relates to the difference between glass and polymers. So how do glass compares to polymer based microfluidics in terms of cost versus performance? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. And I think this is one of the fundamental questions that everybody that wants to start may build in a microfluidic component suit answer from the beginning and what I want to say with that is it is it a pure point of care component that does one measurement then you need to create millions of those and then you have to find a solution that is based on a plastic injection molded solution sorry even though I'm making glass that would be the straight way to go because at the end of the day the question is how much are you going to get from your insurance company, right? As a re reimbursement for the test, okay? And if you say, listen, I'm only measuring one analyte in one specific situation, you're going to get 20 euros. That means that your consumable can only cost a 10th of that, that's two euros. So this kind of a cost analysis has to be done. Now, if you're talking about comparing glass with plastics, the complexity is so broad that it's kind of difficult to do that. But if you say up to 100,000 components, the two technologies at the end of the day are going to line up. If this is already at 50 or at 200,000 components, it's a little bit difficult to say. Uh, what is more interesting, though, is not to say should I go with plastic or glass. The question is what kind of intelligent hybrid solutions can I generate that takes the best of both technologies? both technologies. And we should not be so religious about which is the best material to work with. Yeah, okay, that's a nice uh, point of view and thank you for sharing that. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to end uh, this webinar session. So thanks again, uh, Alexios. Thank you You're to the welcome. audience for attending. And uh, I'd like to meet you again uh, next week for the fourth webinar. So from now on, we no longer have the two weeks intervals between webinars, but we already start next week on the 10th of June. And the fourth uh, presentation will be given by Micronit with more on uh, technology standards and hybrid solutions for microfluidic lab flow, lab flow automation. So with this, I wish you a nice day and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.